What we want to talk about in this last session is, as we've talked about come and sit, and now we want to talk about stay and about also the cumulative effect. When we come to Jesus, sit and learn of him, stay with him, what happens organically as we do those three verbs is we enjoy rest for our souls. So I have, uh, I think our friends in the Glass Enclosed Nerve Center up there somewhere have um, some slides for us and I wanted to tell you some stories also from uh, my trip, my recent trip to Iraq and also uh, the story of a sister in Rwanda that greatly illustrates the whole principle of rest for our souls. So this uh, command to stay, again, sounds like a dog command. And where I take that is from Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we'll talk more about the yoke in just a second, but uh, imagine if you were having a yoke placed on your neck. You can't be moving for that to happen. It is, the yoke is placed over your neck. You are staying with the Lord Jesus as he has used that metaphor that isn't as familiar to us today as it was when he was speaking to those who lived in an agrarian society. And uh, stay, to stay with Jesus is not like stay the dog command, okay? When I leave my house and I tell Gus uh, the woodle and Riley the labradoodle to uh, stay, um, it, it's not because they, you know, I'm gonna go out and do exciting things and they're just gonna be at home kind of passive. The idea of staying with Jesus is a lot more active. Uh, think of, of, um, of the sense of, of us uh, galloping along with him, keeping pace with the one who is in charge, uh, attentively waiting for the leader's command, waiting to see what is it that he wants me to do. I'm staying with him. And anyone who's been in the military can tell you that can be hard. It is a, it's an active passivity. We are actively straining to stay with Jesus, but we are dependent on him. Francis Schaeffer actually called it passive activity. You and I have the, the possibility every moment of our lives to hand ourselves to the Lord. Francis Schaeffer, the, the great um, writer, um, wrote some years ago. The command in Romans that says yield yourself is an active passivity. People are naturally afraid of what is only passive, but we should be afraid of what's only active as well. Our calling is to active passivity. God will bring about our sanctification. He will do it. But we are called to be active partners in the process as we yield ourselves to him. We stay with Jesus. And uh, we, we can't take Jesus' light yoke that he talked about in Matthew 11 if, if we don't stay with him. Our staying is not sort of a, a download of information about him so we can then go on and do our own thing. We, we are joined with him. And if I could have the, the picture of, of the yoke, I've always had a hard time with that concept, again, because we don't see a whole lot of yokes these days, do we? But um, this really helped me to understand uh, of, of what Jesus may have had in mind when he was talking about take my yoke upon you. There's a story of a pastor who was watching a big, huge bull and a little tiny baby bull yoked together, pulling a load. And uh, so, of course, he thought about uh, of the Matthew 11. And what is happening is the little bull, the baby bull, <laughs> is learning how to pull. He doesn't pull any of the weight. He is simply yoked together with the big bull who is pulling all of the weight and joined with him, learning how to be with him. And uh, so I, I love that sense of if we are yoked with Jesus, He's pulling the load, and we have the joy of working with him, of, of uh, making a harvest with him, but he bears the weight as we walk with him and, and we stay with him. And I think, too, of, of in Jesus' day, there's a big difference between what he was talking about of, of take my yoke, my light yoke, and the way that the Pharisees, the religious people of the day, 
uh, talk to the, the people of the day. The Pharisees had their 643 or whatever laws, and for them, the, the law was like a leash, kind of jerking people around. And instead, Jesus brings the, this freedom of him bearing the weight, and yet us being able to be with him. And then for us, we don't, we don't have to have the, the anxiety of, gosh, you know, have I done enough? Am I measuring up? Or the scales of justice when I die, will there be enough on the side of good that I will somehow make it? Uh, no, we are yoked with Jesus in, in the yoke of his, his grace. And since I'm slavishly, must tell you all of my dog um, analogies, I thought of this uh, when I was at the beach. Um, yes, we have beaches in the east. And um, so uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And I had Gus the Woodle with the brain the size of a peanut. And because it was off season, I could just walk the beach, which I love to do, with my dog off leash. Now, Gus is a suburban dog. He never gets to run around off leash. He, he lost his mind. But then as he kind of got the idea and, and, and we just walked for miles along the ocean. And I had that pleasure of being with my little dog. And he, he didn't run away and leave me. He knew that I was there for him in case sharks or, or mean dogs came. <laughs> he was free. He was free to go if he had wanted to. But he stayed with me. He stayed with the master because the yoke that he had was not a leash of the law, but a yoke of love. He knew that I was there for him, that I love him, and the relationship that we had is one, one of freedom. And I, I love that idea because you think of, of the great story of the scriptures. You know, God could have pre-programmed us all to be robots and do the right thing. And instead, he gave this incredible, luxurious, scary gift of freedom. And we are joined with him. We stay with him out of love. Incredible gift. Later when you have time, I want you to, to go back and take some time meditating in John 15. When you think about staying with Jesus, think about uh, that, that wonderful um, chunk of scripture of Jesus' uh, words to his friends on, during the Last Supper. And again, the, the abide in me and I in you. As a branch can't bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. If anyone doesn't abide in me, he's cast out as a branch. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you desire and it will be done for you. As the Father has loved me, so have I also loved you. Abide in my love. Again and again and again, he uses the, the verb to, to abide, remain in me, remain in me, stay with me, stay in me. And the, the richness of what our lives can be about in this mysterious abiding, staying with Jesus. And again, you know, my tendency is, is gosh, you know, I want to have a list of, well, here's all we need to do to stay with Jesus. One, two, three, four. Um, five tips about how to do that um, simply so we can check off our boxes. Uh, but the older I get, and, and now I'm older than I've ever been, um, <laughs> I find that I embrace more of the mystery rather than the tidy sort of cognitive answers in my relationship with Jesus. Because a lot of what, what the Lord Jesus um, talks about in his word and relates with us in an everyday intimate relationship with him. It's, it's mysterious. It's not something that you just uh, can formulize, right? And I think sometimes in modern evangelicalism, we have lost a sense, a rich sense of, of mystery. It doesn't mean that it's incoherent, doesn't mean that it's uh, uh, counterintuitive, but what it, it does mean is, oh my goodness gracious, the grace of God is far more huge, far more mysterious than, than we can imagine. And so the question for all of us is, will you stay? Will you stay with Jesus? Will you remain with him? Will you actually lose yourself in this relationship that can sweep over you like an ocean? Will you open yourself totally to this lover of your soul who has fought the forces of evil and hell to rescue you, his beloved? I'm saying that in, in more poetic terms 
Because what we all need right now is not an, an, a, a wonderful biblical exegesis of, uh, of John 15, as great as that would be. But I think what it comes down to is, are we willing to stay with Jesus? Are we willing to open ourselves more and more to the, the intimacy of a trust relationship with this one who loves us so much? Because the fact is, we will give ourselves to one thing or another. We will have one kind of master or another. And if I could have the next slide, I don't know about you, but I am, uh, this is what, <laughs> when I go my own way, this is what my inner self looks like. <laughs> I am Jabba the Hutt. And I don't mean that I have low self-esteem and I think that my inner self is all ugly, but what I mean is, I may as well align myself with the Lord Jesus Christ and remain in him and be yoked with him because otherwise I will be yoked by something that will destroy my soul. Whether it's a chemical or a substance or a toxic relationship or the slavery to self and sin, we will be ruled by one thing or another. We will be yoked. We need to choose which yoke we're going to take. Galatians 5 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. So we may as well throw ourselves whole hog <laughs> into this relationship with Jesus. It is so easy for us to, to settle for something far less than the life that he has for us, the life of adventure and mystery that we can have when we are yoked with him. The next slide, here's an illustration. This is a few years ago in Washington, D.C., where I live, we experienced snowmageddon, okay? <laughs> I believe those are either elephants or cars that have been snowed, snowed under. And uh, so it, it, we, it was very unusual for our area. And so at the time, I had three teenagers at home, and you know we stocked up on milk and eggs and toilet paper and all the things you're supposed to get before a big storm. And then the wind howled, and the snow came, and it came, and it came. And we lost power. We sent Gus the Woodle out to do his business and did not find him again until the springtime. <laughs> and, you know, my teenagers were absolutely flummoxed. You know, like, <laughs> what is this life without electronics? And, um, but, you know, we have a gas stove so we could melt snow on the stove and have water. And, you know, we had peanut butter. And, and uh, so, you know, we could, we could kind of manage with the power off. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't bathe because there was no hot water, so we did get kind of dirty. But, you know, we had some things to eat, not savory hot food, but we could kind of make do along the way. And, and it, was, it was cold and, and dark and gray, but, you know, we, we could make do. And obviously, <laughs> that's an imperfect um, analogy. But the fact is, Without power, you know, we could sort of function, but the fact was we had no power. <laughs> and when that power came on, we were ecstatic. We, we, we could get clean again. We could eat savory feasts of hot food. And how often is it in our spiritual life when we're not remaining in Jesus and we don't have power? And we're like, oh, I'm fine. I have two broken legs and I'm miserable, but I'm fine, you know. When we are plugged into him is when we have the power. And no one who has had power would dream of living the cold gray life without power. But so often we can be seduced into that gray world. And what happens in the next slide is when we have power, obviously that's when we can yield fruit, as Jesus says, if we abide in him. It's not like when, when we are yielding fruit that we have to try so hard. It's not like a grape going, arr, arr, I could be a grape, I could be a grape. No, it is the fruit of the Spirit flows because of the living power of the Word of God in us and the Holy Spirit at work doing what He loves to do. There is so much more that we could, could say on that point. I know you, you get it. So uh, <laughs> at any rate... 
I wanna switch gears a little bit because I would be remiss if I didn't tie some of these truths into the, uh, the trip to Iraq uh, just a few weeks ago. So the next slide, please, and we'll go through these pretty quick, quickly if we can, the slides. But again, think, this is actually from a trip to Egypt, but we know the things that our brothers and sisters in the Middle East have been through. The burning of, of, of dozens and dozens and dozens of churches in Egypt in the summer of 2013 by the Muslim Brotherhood. What was the response of the Christians in Egypt? In church after church after church that had been destroyed and there was maybe only a charred wall left, on the walls of, of the, the broken walls of the burned churches, messages went up in Arabic. We forgive you. We still love you. The love of Christ constrains us. And it wasn't like an email went out to all the churches in Egypt. Here's how we're all going to respond. It was the, the Holy Spirit moving in those courageous Christians to respond with love to such, such horrors. And then the next slide, you all know that in Iraq, in the summer, last summer, ISIS um, first captured Mosul, the second largest city in Iraq, and then worked its way through the ancient Nineveh Plain, which is an area almost entirely populated by Christians, and drove the Christians out of their homes. In one night on August 6th of last summer, 40,000 Christians had to flee for their lives in front of ISIS, and 200,000 people in total now have, are living in displaced people camps in really bad conditions in northern Iraq. That some of them had to flee only with the clothes on their backs, didn't even like take identity papers or, or anything. ISIS came through, plundered houses, uh, just all kinds of terrible horrors. And when you hear figures, next slide please, of, of 200,000 people or 400,000 people, these are the people we're talking about. They are not statistics. This little boy chased from his home by ISIS. Next slide. This little girl displaced from her home by ISIS. Next slide. This little girl, you've heard in the news about the Yazidis, the Yazidis who were all surrounded by ISIS on Mount Sinjar last uh, summer. Yazidis is uh, it's a minority people group. They are not um, Christians and they are held in derision by uh, the Muslim extremists because they are not people of the book, okay? And so we interviewed a number of Yazidi women who had been captured by ISIS and treated as sex slaves and had escaped. And when ISIS, if we could have that slide back, please, when ISIS would sell women in the slave markets, if their eyes are a lighter color, they get more money for them. Unbelievable, this little girl is safe, but a Yazidi child. And had a great conversation with a man who works with Samaritan's Purse in Northern Iraq. He said that the Yazidis are coming to faith in Jesus in huge numbers these days. So there, are, there, there is always hope in the midst of the darkness. Be praying for the word of God to be going forth in Iraq. The next slide, please. Um, this is, is a little girl I met. I was in a displacement camp and she came running up to me and she said, hello, my name is Tamara, I love you. <laughs> and that was all the English she knew, but that was good for me. And uh, then I was interviewing her mom. Now they were displaced from their home by ISIS. The mom tells me that in the camp where they live every night at 10 o'clock, they all pray together. And then the mom was telling me a few years ago, she was in Mosul and an IED exploded, an improvised bomb, and shrapnel flew, and in fact, she said, it, um, I lost my right eye. And then, while I'm talking with her, she pops her eyeball out, and it's like, you know, <laughs> and I'm looking at, and it's like, it has a brown iris, it was really nice, and, and, so, and she was just, so that's what happened, but the Lord has been so good to me, and then kind of puts her back in. <laughs> it's always something. So the next slide, please. Oh gosh, I didn't even know I had this one. So <laughs> this lady is an elderly Christian. She's probably younger than me, but um, time has, has been hard on her. She was kidnapped by ISIS and then they released her. And she was a, just the happiest woman. She was like, hey, the Lord is with me, with, and it's through a translator, but he's always with me whether I'm captured, whether they let me go, whether I live or I die. She was happy camper. So amazing. Uh, next slide. 
So I interviewed this couple, and they live in a, um, an unfinished, uh, half-finished um, mall. It's all cold concrete, and they have a little, maybe 10 by 10 sort of room uh, in, in there. There was no electricity. The whole interview was conducted in the dark. Um, with the translator shining a flashlight on this poor lady's face so I could take notes. And the husband didn't mind the lack of electricity because he's blind. Uh, the, the wife told the story of how they were captured by uh, ISIS forces and they were put onto a, a, a minibus kind of thing where all of the windows had been covered over with mud to block out the light. And she was holding, she looks old, but she had, she had a, a three-year-old daughter, Christine. And she's holding her daughter, and one of the ISIS men came and tore her daughter out of her arms. And the daughter was given to an elderly imam. And what she told me is that the daughter that now is living uh, in a, uh, with a, a Muslim family in, um, in Mosul, an ISIS family, and they had received taunting cell phone calls saying, we have your daughter and we are raising her to be a child of ISIS. When she grows up, she will be ashamed of you. When you think of this couple, pray for them. Pray that their daughter might be uh, returned. The next slide, please. Oh, while we were there, it was necessary to have uh, security. And so it was, we had, there was a big vehicle, soldiers, and rocket launchers. I mean, it's like, uh, next slide. And so, uh, <laughs> so we were um, a, a small, there were five of us traveling, and one is, was a former Congressman Frank Wolf, who is a wonderful brother in Christ and has just retired from Congress, and I am working with him in this 21st Century Wilberforce Initiative on uh, religious freedom and human rights issues. So I loved traveling with him, but I w we did have to have quite a bit of security because the congressman would have been a big fat target for abduction. He's not fat, I didn't mean it like that. But um, <laughs> anyway, next slide. So, uh, I talked with you earlier about Mama Maggie. And when the book about Mama Maggie was released, uh, in Washington, we had a, a large uh, um, celebration of that event. And Mama Maggie came from Egypt, and she was there. And uh, she uh, told us about how, of this famous photo that is emblazoned in all of our minds, the 21 Coptic Christian men who were slaughtered so cruelly by ISIS on that beach in Libya, seven of those young men had been ministered to by Mama Maggie's ministry when they were little boys. And two of them had taught in her schools. And these were, were men, not just sort of cultural Christians or Christians in name only. These were men who, who knew Jesus. And when I was in Egypt going to Mama Maggie's uh, different kindergartens and schools in the slum areas, uh, she is really big on Bible memory. And so I went to classrooms full of little children uh, shouting out, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, first in Arabic and then in English. And if we could keep that slide up, please. I think it's important that we look at it as hard as it is to look. But these men, one thing that ISIS did, one of their mothers was interviewed by uh, Newsweek, and she said, in a way, ISIS did us a favor because now the whole world knows what Christianity is really about. Because in the Arabic, in the, the Arabic, you can hear them whispering as they are being killed, whispering the name of Jesus. And they would have known the scriptures from the time they were little boys. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when it came to their end, they were able to die well. Horrible, of course. But what Mama Maggie uh, said when she was, was telling us about um, her boys, uh, she said, you know, I, I ate with them, I laughed with them, I played with them, I prayed with them. They were my boys. And she said, the thing is, we can't control the length of our days, 
None of us can control how long we will live. She said, but what we can control is the depth of our days, the integrity and the closeness to how we stay with Jesus and remain in him. And so we have a choice. You can take the slide off. So that's where I want to conclude. Again, that's just a, the tip of, a, um, of the iceberg of the, uh, the stories and some of the faces of the people uh, I was with in Iraq and also in Egypt. But oh, sisters, let us be women who are faithful in praying for our sisters and our brothers around the world. And I feel like um, part of, of my calling is to try to tell their stories. So we have pictures of real people in our minds, real stories. And to know too that even in the disastrous situations that I saw in Iraq, people's uh, faith was stronger than ever. I uh, had thought I had slides, but I guess I don't, of um, a grandfather I interviewed. And he, uh, and the, what had happened was his wife, the grandmother, was out in the courtyard one uh, morning last August when the ISIS forces started to overrun uh, the areas where the Christians lived. And uh, so the grandmother's outside with, with um, three little boys, the grandchildren. And there was a mortar round that came in. And what the grandmother told me was it was like it was raining meat. It, there was blood everywhere. The children were destroyed. And the grandmother, when that bomb fell, had been actually, she had been praying. And then she just was like, oh, Lord, why would you not take me? I'm old. Why? And they, uh, it is a different culture there, so they showed me pictures, photographs, of the bloody courtyard. And I said to the grandfather, has this caused you to, to lose your faith in God? And he said, oh, no. No, my faith is stronger than ever, through the interpreter. And then he said this. I'm looking at the pictures of the bloodied, bloodied courtyard. And he says, after all, it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all evil. The evil that ISIS is doing around the world, the evils that Satan would perpetuate everywhere are overcome by the blood of Jesus. Mm. So I want to end with one last story. And as I said at the outset, the fact is again, and, and I hope the book will explain it in a, a more <laughs> coherent fashion than I have in these, these quick sessions, but uh, when we come to Jesus, sit with him, and stay with him, the organic result of that is that we will have rest for our souls, as he promises. And a, a few years ago, I interviewed a beautiful sister of ours who lives in Rwanda. I had gone to Rwanda and interviewed different um, believers who had been affected by the terrible genocide there um, some years ago. And this woman's name is, is Christine. And as you know, in the genocide in Rwanda, there are two uh, tribal groups, the, the Tutsis and the Hutus. And in the beginning of the genocide, the, um, it's a very complex situation to explain. This is just an overview. But uh, a million Tutsis were massacred um, by Hutus, and then there was some retaliation. And it was a horrific situation in Rwanda. And Christine's husband is a pastor. They had a big uh, mother church in Kigali, which is the capital of Rwanda, and then a bunch of, of daughter churches surrounding, in surrounding villages. And in 100 days, as I said, about a million people were killed. Most of them were hacked to death by machetes. And uh, it, it was a, a, a dark, horrible time. Three quarters of the congregation of Christine's church were killed. And her husband happened to be out of the country. She was at home alone and could not leave her home because there were roadblocks set up. There were uh, thugs on the streets who would kill anyone who, who they felt didn't look quite right. And um, so she, of course, was, was terrified. And she could not sleep. And she could hear the sounds outside of people being dragged from their houses. And she absolutely exhausted. You know, little catnaps, but terror of, of such a horrific type of death. And so she 
had kind of a, a, a vision, a sense of, as she was praying, of Jesus' death on the cross. And she knew that the forces that were operating in Rwanda in that horrific time were not political forces. She knew that these were forces of Satan, the one who comes to rob, steal, and destroy, destroy. And then she, she saw how, how Satan had come to Rwanda to, to wreak this kind of havoc. And then she had a picture in her mind of Jesus on the cross, asking God, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And she, she sensed inside of herself, this wonderful Christian sister, the weight of her own sins that, had, had, that Jesus had died for. And she prayed for what she called a holy revenge to come to Rwanda, that the power of the Holy Spirit would defeat the dark uh, evils that uh, were, were overflowing that land. And she told me when she had that sense of Jesus on the cross and his forgiveness and the fact that there's this spiritual warfare, she uh, said, and then I just felt the Holy Spirit come over me. I felt innocent like a baby. And she slept a deep sleep of peace. That's literal rest, but she was free rest for her soul, even in the midst of that kind of horror. She's from the Tutsi tribe. A Hutu friend helped her to escape. And today she and her husband are, are working hard in, in wonderful, fruitful ministry in Rwanda. She said that God made a way, a resting place is what she called it, in the midst of chaos. And what she said, understandably, is that she had no idea why she had lived and so many others had died. And she felt that, that her sense of the rest of God, the peace of God in the midst of horrific calamity wasn't really dependent on the outcome. Her peace, her rest, wasn't dependent really on whether she lived or died. My peace in my husband's cancer challenge is not dependent on Lee being cancer free. Our peace in the midst of terrible situations is not dependent on whether our prodigal child returns or not, or our errant husband returns or not, or we uh, find the perfect job, or you know all of the outcomes that can cloud our view of what is the most important thing and the true source of our peace, and that is the Lord Jesus himself. I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble again says Jesus. But take heart, dear sisters, I have overcome the world. And so I, as I close, I would say, you know, we can easily be afraid. But who is this Jesus who calls us, come to me, come to me, beloved one, the one who flung the stars into creation, who by his words, the universe was formed, the one who went to the cross and defeated sin and death and hell forever for us. He is the one who is calling us. So there is no place else for us to end than these great verses, of course, from, from Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, I saw this with our sisters and brothers in Iraq living this out. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. That is our hope.